Good evening. After a bruising encounter in Brussels, the Prime Minister says she still believes she can get extra assurances from EU leaders to help get her exit withdrawal agreement through Parliament. EU leaders have said no to any renegotiation, but will offer what they call further clarifications on the Irish backstop, the mechanism to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland if the UK and EU fail to agree a trade deal. Theresa May was filmed having a discussion with the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker during which she accused him of saying her latest proposals are nebulous. He blamed it on a misunderstanding. Our political editor Laura Koonsberg has the latest. A bad omen, a bitter morning for more than one reason. The Prime Minister came to Brussels to bring concessions from the EU. Does the EU like your plan Prime Minister? But they didn't just say no. One of their top politicians said she didn't even know what she wanted. She was nebulous, leading this private, careful politician to show real anger. Did you call me nebulous, she seems to say to Jean-Claude Juncker. He grasping her arm. The microphones may be off, but you can see exactly what went on. The Dutch Prime Minister comes along to try to make peace. Later, she had not forgotten the accusation. I was crystal clear about the assurance stop, having heard the views of MPs in the House of Commons. I reiterated that it is in the interests of the EU as well as the UK to get this over the line. And that it's EU leaders had said she would not get those concessions on the so-called backstop. She begged to differ. My discussions with colleagues today further clarification and discussion following the Council's conclusions is in fact possible. You looked very angry when you were speaking to Jean-Claude Juncker earlier today. What did you say to him and did he admit that he had called you nebulous? Um, and secondly, the summit conclusions suggest the EU is not willing to budge, but you appear to be saying that they might. Can you tell us more about what they've said to you about their willingness to move? Because if Parliament won't budge and the EU won't budge, is it time for you to budge? Well, first of all, I had a robust discussion with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. I think that's the sort of discussion you're able to have when you've uh, developed a working relationship and you work well together. Uh, and uh, what came out of that was his clarity that actually he'd been talking, when he used that particular phrase, he'd been talking about the, a general level of debate. We can look at this issue of further clarification. Uh, and... That has been something I've been discussing with a number of EU leaders. So we will be working uh, expeditiously over the coming days to uh, seek those further assurances that I believe MPs will need. You might wonder what exactly has been going on with these negotiations. What are the misunderstandings in the relations between the EU and the Prime Minister? What has the President of the European Commission really been up to since that row? Da, da, da. <laughs> we were not dancing. She thought that I did criticize her by saying yesterday night that the British position was nebulous. I did refer to her, but to the overall state of the debate in Britain. And in the course of the morning, after having checked what I said yesterday night, she was kissing me. We have treated Prime Minister May with, with, with a much greater empathy and respect than, than some British MPs, for sure. We have to bring down the temperature. And uh, these attacks coming from Westminster against Europe, against the European Commission, will not be responded in the same way by the European Commission and by the European Union. <laughs> although I would like to do it. On and off the stage, the message from the EU is clear. They promise they'll do a trade deal as quickly as possible, so the backstop's never needed. But that cannot mean what's already been agreed. We will not renegotiate it and we do not want to reopen it. Uh, but uh, Theresa is, of course, a, a, a tough negotiator and uh, there's a lot of understanding also uh, for, for what UK wants. But uh, I think we have to uh, find a well, way to deal with each other. I think that the current deal is a good one for both sides. And hearing what's been said in Brussels back in Westminster, 
that just won't wash with MPs who are demanding new legal guarantees. To coin a phrase, it was a bit nebulous. <laughs> um, uh, she hasn't provided any new guarantees at all about the withdrawal agreement uh, or specifically the backstop. So she's been to the European Council, uh, she's expressed her concerns and they've given her absolutely nothing. We know the answer to the question whether there's going to be changes and it's no. What we need is for this vote to be put next week for us to vote on it and then for Parliament to take control of the process. The Prime Minister leaves here with a big problem. Remember, she kept her job in part this week because she promised she could get more compromise from her fellow EU leaders. But she's left tonight with assurances that there could be more conversations and that simply might not be concrete enough to protect her in a hostile environment at home. Expectations even yesterday were of more positive promises, but bumpy late-night talks diluted those. The cold truth is the lack of trust at Westminster is felt 200 miles away. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Brussels. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, who's in Downing Street. But first, let's talk to our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus, in Brussels. And Damien, the EU doesn't appear to be budging an inch, really. I mean, what chance are Theresa May is going to get anything significant out of Brussels? Fiona, I think very little sign that anything is coming in, in the near future. Going into this summit, there were some countries, Germany, Austria, that were open to the idea of looking at this. But what seems to have happened is that when Theresa May addressed those EU leaders last night for about an hour, a group of countries took a tougher line, Ireland, France, Belgium, and they won out the argument, and EU unity is held there. They felt that the UK was not being clear enough. When Theresa May was asking a, a, for a, a trade deal by a specific date, they seemed to have asked, what sort of trade deal? Do you want to be in a customs union? And they said the answer was not clear. So they could not commit to something uh, that would tie their hands at this stage. And there is another problem, too. I think these countries look at situation in the UK and they are worried. They feel that if they give concessions at this stage that the UK would take those and simply come back demanding more. So countries like Ireland are very concerned. The Irish Prime Minister is saying you cannot have an international negotiation with the partner that you agreed something with two weeks ago who comes back again wanting more two weeks later. So there's no sign in the coming days of the EU moving, no summit plans, no formal talks. Only Donald Tusk saying that his door is open if the UK has new proposals to make. Fiona. And John, uh, in Downing Street, Theresa May is back in the UK now. What lies ahead for her here? Well, Fiona, after her harsh trial of a week, it almost seems an achievement for Theresa May to be still in office, still fighting against the odds. And the odds truly do look heavy. At Westminster tonight, her plan looks like a defeat waiting to happen. There are Conservatives who believe it's the best deal possible. And she's going to go on pressing EU leaders for more ways to win over the Commons. But the Brexiteers are regrouping. And in the Cabinet, there are ministers like Amber Rudd, who will be pressing for more votes in the Commons to sound out other plans, including perhaps a Brexit with closer links to the European Union. As for a second referendum, the campaigners for that, including Tony Blair, are saying now, as he did today, that he thinks that's the most likely outcome. And at a Leavers rally near here this evening, Nigel Farage told the BBC he thought they may just be right about that. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, he is not at all keen on a second referendum. He's waiting for the moment to inflict the maximum damage by pressing for a vote of confidence in the government. That may be next week, more likely, I think, in the new year. But it's going to be a torrid time for Theresa May when she reports on today's summit to MPs on Monday. As MPs, Fiona, get ready for the summer break. Theresa May is keeping faith with her plan, but hope is running short. And as for charity in British politics, that is running very thin indeed. John in Downing Street and Damien in uh, Brussels. Thank you both very much. Donald Trump's former personal lawyer claims the president is a liar and ordered him to pay off two women during the 2016 presidential election, even though Mr. Trump knew it was wrong. In an interview with ABC News, Michael Cohen, who's facing three years in prison, said Mr. Trump ordered the payments because he feared the women's allegations he'd had affairs with them would damage his presidential campaign. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has more. 
an alleged one-night stand in 2006, and then a payment to buy Stormy Daniels' silence ten years later, just before the 2016 elections. They're still causing Donald Trump and those around him endless legal nightmares. The president's longtime lawyer, Mr. Fixit, Michael Cohen, was this week sentenced to three years in prison. And he's now given an interview refuting Donald Trump's claims that he made the payments to her without the president knowing about it. First of all, nothing at the Trump organization was ever done unless it was run through Trump. He directed me, as I said in my allocution, and I said as well in the plea, he directed me to make the payments, he directed me to become involved in these matters. I'm going to use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. The payment came at a delicate time in the presidential campaign. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. A tape had emerged of Donald Trump boasting about sexually assaulting women. In the interview today, Cohen said the payment was made because the president wanted to avoid fresh scandal weeks before the election. He was trying to hide what you were doing, correct? Correct. And he knew it was wrong? Of course. And he was doing that to help his election? He, you have to remember at what point in time that this matter came about, two weeks or so before the election, post the Billy Bush comments. So yes, he was very concerned about how this would affect the election. But Donald Trump says Cohen is a proven liar, and his only regret is ever employing him. I never directed him to do anything wrong. Whatever he did, he did on his own. He's a lawyer. A lawyer who represents a client is supposed to do the right thing. That's why you pay them a lot of money, etc., etc. Donald Trump's account of what happened has changed consistently. First of all, denying he knew anything about a payment to Stormy Daniels, then admitting he did, then saying it had nothing to do with campaign finance, it was a personal matter, and then saying, well, yes, campaign finances, but that's not against the law. And finally, his lawyer saying, Nobody got killed, no one was robbed, this is not a big crime. In other words, it didn't really matter what Donald Trump had done. John Sopel, BBC News, Washington. A 16-year-old boy has been convicted of raping and murdering a 14-year-old girl in a Wolverhampton park. Victoria Sokolova had arranged to meet the boy in the city's West Park last April. He can't be named because of his age, but faces a mandatory life sentence. After a week in which allegations of racism in football have grabbed the headlines, England's Premier League has urged fans to report unacceptable behaviour. Chelsea have strongly condemned supporters who chanted anti-Semitic abuse during a match in Hungary last night, saying they have shamed the club, as our sports correspondent Joe Wilson reports. At their home ground, Chelsea present a welcome to the world. But this is a football club shamed by a section of its supporters. Chelsea made that clear today. He's played a... Last night, some Chelsea fans used a match in Hungary to chant anti-Semitic words about a rival club in London, Tottenham. It's not an isolated example. It is vile. Educational films have been made, endorsed by Chelsea, showing previous incidents of fans making anti-Tottenham chants and showing the historical reality of the Holocaust. There is an element of, of that chant which is meant to be just anti-Tottenham. And that's the whole point of the film, to say... You might think you're making a Tottenham, ch Tottenham chants, but actually, when you when you make when you sing Spurs are on their way to Auschwitz, this is what you, you're really chanting about. Chelsea know the problem. The club promised today that any individuals found to have shamed the club by using anti-Semitic or racist words or actions will face the strongest possible action from the club. Instances of anti-Semitism are especially poignant and hard to comprehend at this club. After all, Roman Abramovich, who has bankrolled Chelsea for so many years, is himself Jewish. But last night's events come hard on the heels of Chelsea's game against Manchester City. And what happened there to Raheem Sterling? Chelsea have suspended four people from attending games after allegations by Raheem Sterling that he was racially abused. So, a grim old problem returning or a sign of today's times? racial events in, in, in our game which we are trying as hard as we can to uh, eradicate are always going to happen and uh, you hope you hope that it's something that doesn't escalate sometimes when you know times are harder then 
you know, they become more prevalent. But, but, but racism holds no place in, a, in our game. It holds no place uh, in society. Today's the time on chicken. End and over the many festive matches to come is just how far football's problem extends. Joe Wilson, BBC News, West London. A day after a ceasefire was announced that peace talks to end Yemen's war, the United Nations says a monitoring system is urgently needed to oversee the agreement and end the world's worst humanitarian crisis. The ceasefire covers the key Red Sea port of Hodeida and the adjacent city, a vital lifeline which has become the war's main battleground. More food aid has now begun arriving at the port. The UN has warned that 14 million Yemenis are on the brink of starvation. Well, our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucet, is here with me. So, Lee, there are reports of, of some gunfire outside the port. This is such a fragile ceasefire, but just desperately needed. So fragile, Fiona, and so fraught with risk. But it is an agreement, a ceasefire, and it marks the most significant breakthrough in five years of UN talks. And it has provoked this palpable relief and this extraordinary burst of hope among Yemenis. One Yemeni woman activist sent me a message to say, did you see this special moment, this message for peace? Did you see the handshake? And she was referring to the handshake between the head of the Yemeni government delegation and the head of the Houthi delegation. In the middle, the smiling UN Secretary General and the Yemeni Foreign Minister joked, we don't need you to get us to shake hands. We're brothers. But the reality is there is so little trust and such a huge risk that this is just going to fall apart. But one thing which will keep it together is the unprecedented international pressure, and in particular, the U.S. pressure on Saudi Arabia to bring an end to this destructive war. Because Yemen isn't just a brutal war, as bad as that is. It is a country facing what the U.N. has called the worst famine in living memory. The country, the people are at breaking point. And that's why so many Yemenis now are just daring to hope against hope. Elise, thank you. A five-week-old baby boy has died after he was attacked by two dogs. Reuben McNulty was mauled by a terrorist at a house in Yaxley in Cambridgeshire last month. He died today from his injuries. Reuben's parents, Daniel McNulty and Amy Litchfield, are believed locally to be the two patients and released by police. A silent walk has been taking place in West London tonight to mark 18 months since the Grenfell Tower fire which killed 72 people in June last year. The first part of the Grenfell inquiry, which looked at failures before and during the fire itself, ended this week. But the inquiry's chairman has said the second phase, which will look at the wider causes of the fire, is unlikely to begin before the end of next year. Our special correspondent Lucy Manning has been talking to two survivors about how they feel about the inquiry so far. The state palpably failed in its primary duty to protect its citizens. I don't know how that building is still standing to this day. We should have all been dead. If they were evacuated, the people's lives could be saved. Sid Ali Atmani and Mahad Agal survived Grenfell with their families. Both provided evidence to the inquiry. I was completely lost. The only solution I, 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 I have to take is to get up. After nearly a hundred days of evidence, they wait on some answers. They need to deliver. He needs to make sure to deliver the criminals. The one they are responsible for killing people. I feel that a lot has been unearthed. and I hope to see that the corporates are under more scrutiny. The inquiry has heard a litany of safety failures. Harrowing 999 calls. Don't give up. You can't give up. Don't give up. Come on, what's the fire brigade? Jesus! They should be there. <laughs> Come on, Joe. Officials who didn't immediately send building plans and a list of residents to firefighters. What were you actually doing during that period? Standing there, responding to food and calls, speaking to people on the phone. Not very much. Firemen who cried for those they couldn't save. To the family of the people in Flat 175, uh, I was. Um, looking for another girl. I didn't know there was anyone in there. And a fire chief who wouldn't accept they should have responded differently. I wouldn't change anything we did on the night. I think uh, without exception my firefighters, my officers and my control staff performed in a fantastic way. You could have changed a lot of, a lot of things in that night.
it could happen. She wouldn't change also the 72 people who died. She could have put her statement in a different way. Perhaps they could have had an improvised a plan B for evacuation. The inquiry chairman will deliver an interim report next year, but the second part of this inquiry looking at wider issues is set to be delayed. Personally speaking, I, I think that there's more people now put at risk because phase two has been delayed and the conclusion to the inquiry is not being reached. So it could be more than three years after the fire when this inquiry finally ends. Lucy Manning, BBC News. A fourth person has died as a result of injuries sustained in a gun attack in the French city of Strasbourg on Tuesday. Visiting the city tonight, the French President Emmanuel Macron laid a white rose in the victim's memory and paid tribute to the French security forces. The gunman, Sharif Shekat, was shot dead last night after he opened fire on police officers. Liverpool's Egyptian striker Mo Salah has won the BBC's African Footballer of the Year award for the second year running. His 10 goals in 16 games have helped Liverpool to the top of the Premier League. Salah said he hoped to win it again next year as well. Members of the royal family have made public their Christmas cards. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are pictured with their three children at their Norfolk home, while Harry and Meghan have chosen a picture of themselves watching the fireworks on the evening of their wedding. A British yachtswoman whose boat capsized in a storm in the South Pacific, 2,000 miles offshore, has finally set foot on dry land in Chile. It's a week since Susie Goodall was rescued by a Chinese cargo ship while competing in the solo Golden Globe Round the World race. This evening, she said she would happily attempt the race all over again. Duncan Kennedy has more. This is what relief looks like when you step ashore after surviving the drama of a mid-ocean crisis. A hug from mum, Brigitte, and brother, Tim, means Susie Goodall's ordeal is finally over. Then it was on to a medical checkup before she gave her first insight into the trauma she faced 2,000 miles from land. If you ask me if I would do this again, now knowing what it's like, I would say yes in a heartbeat. But as I said to the Chilean Navy captain who brought me ashore from Tianfu, I created so much work for everyone involved in the rescue, to which he responded, of course you must do it again. You may ask why. Some people just live for adventure. It's human nature. And for me, the sea is where my adventure lies. It was the wild seas of the Southern Ocean with its seven meter waves that triggered the emergency last week. In sailing terms, Susie's yacht pitch poled, meaning it somersaulted forward end over end, smashing the mast and leaving her stranded for more than two days. The boat is destroyed. Inside and out is destroyed. It took a crane from a passing freight ship to hoist her out of danger. Susie, who's 29, was the youngest competitor in this Golden Globe race before she hit the storm. But she trained here at the UK Sailing Academy on the Isle of Wight. This afternoon, we showed her friends the moment she made it back to shore in Chile. Gives you goosebumps. Really pleased for Susie and especially her family. Um, she's been through uh, a, a, a real ordeal and experience and adventure over the last few weeks. So, so pleased that she's made it back safely. Susie Goodall is the third sailor to be rescued in this year's race, but now she's safe and heading home for Christmas. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News. And that's it from us here on BBC One. It's now time for the news where you are. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Sports Day. I'm Ben Croucher. These are your Friday night headlines. Football fans are accused of using the political atmosphere as a cover for their own racism, following anti-Semitic chants from Chelsea supporters. Hearts concede five times in 14 minutes and have a man sent off as they lose at Livingston. 
Exeter win in Europe for the first time this season to keep alive their hopes in the Champions Cup. And Mo Awards for Salah as he's named the African Footballer of the Year for the second year in a row. Great feeling, you know, I would like to win it also next year, so I'm looking forward from now. But, you know, it's a great feeling to win another award two years in a row, so happy to win it. Well, very good evening to you. We'll start with the issue that just won't go away in football right now. Less than a week after banning four fans for alleged racist abuse of Raheem Sterling, Chelsea have condemned a small minority of supporters for shaming the club. It follows anti-Semitic chants during their Europa League tie in Hungary last night. The Blues say they'll take the strongest possible action over what they call an abhorrent incident. Anti-discrimination group FAIR says that some fans are using the political atmosphere as a cover for their own prejudice. When it comes to, uh, to English football, it is still far from, uh, far from inclusive and welcoming as it is you know, celebrated sometimes. So these elements are still there and uh, we see the, the increase in the number of groups that are using football as, um, as a tool for their propaganda of hate. And I think it is uh, definitely connected to the political developments and the type of language the media also uses. Well, there aren't many greater heroes in Chelsea's history than their former midfielder and record goalscorer Frank Lampard. He's dismayed by a lack of respect demonstrated at football and in today's society in general. I think in a bigger picture, and there is one here, and this is not to exclude racism, racism is part of this, but I do get disappointed with the amount of, of hate that goes on in the modern uh, society and game. Some of it social media based. It's very plausible now to say, I don't like you because of how you look, because of your sex, because of your preferences, because of um, your family, because of your decisions that you made in your career. I think that's something we need to look at and that's just about decency. Well, the issues around abusive fans and the role the media has to play in racial prejudice has come into stark focus this week. Raheem Sterling has accused the newspapers of helping to fuel racism and the way that they portray young black footballers. Hugh Wiesencroft has been finding out more. Well, Raheem Sterling's words have got me and many others in the sports journalism industry thinking about the current state of play, I guess. And I've called on some of my fellow black sports journalists to examine the state of the industry. I don't think it's too much hyperbole to suggest that what Raheem Sterling has done is a game changer for me because what he's done is really made editors and people in positions of power look at themselves. I think Raheem Sterling's done something very, very brave, but we can't leave him on his own. This is a moment for us. It's just what happens from here. Because this is really about better journalism. This is, this is about making sure there are more thorough processes. If discussions were made about Raheem Sterling's leg, you know, and if there were um, proper debates um, before that was published, maybe it wouldn't have been published. I had an experience, I was working for a mainstream newspaper when Griezmann blacked up for the party and the editors there, because they had someone there that was of colour, because it was someone who had gone through personal experience, who would have a personal um, opinion on the blackface, they asked me, was it racist? How do you think we should word this headline? Should we accuse him of being a racist? If you don't have anyone there who has that personal experience, how can you create the correct story, the correct headline, and tell it with the correct perspective. You know, a lot of sports journalists say it's not them that write these stories. They come from the front page, the news journalists, and that's something that maybe members of the public don't understand. There's still no excuse for some of the language, some of the writing, reporting of some of these players. I think that it's easy to sell. It's not us. It's the front pages of the of the newspapers. They're the ones that are writing negatively about Raheem Sterling. I've seen some back page headlines about Raheem Sterling as well, so they have to be accountable too. The words you write about people are very, very powerful, and I think now we're going to watch and read with extreme scrutiny about how going forward uh, football writers write about black players in particular. I think even if it is different parts of the newspaper, if you're not calling it out, you're enabling it. I think the narrative around um, footballers is that they work hard, 
Um, I think the narrative around black footballers is they're naturally gifted. One suggests you work to where you get to. The other suggests you're just given it because you were born with it. And why aren't you doing more with it? And that's a narrative that John Barnes had to live through. It's a narrative that Ian Wright had to live through. So let's hope things get better. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk. You know, but no one's back in their chat. Everyone says, oh, we understand our newsroom isn't diverse. We understand we don't have enough women, enough non-white people, or enough people of a certain age, a certain socio-demographic. And you see them three years later, and they repeat the same thing to you, and nothing has changed. This is an uncomfortable moment for the media, for our industry. But this discomfort that, 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 that white journalists are feeling right now about this conversation is the discomfort that many of us black sports journalists, journalists have felt just going into white environments to do our jobs every single day. They need to consider that. They need to consider, you know, the sensitivities around the situations that we've been put in um, over the years and the way that they have been responded to. There is a lack of diversity in our industry. It needs to be addressed and we need to see some action. And what I will find is as well, if you love football and if you love sports and you want sport and football to be better, make the industry more diverse. Because the more diverse football is, the more diverse football media is, the better it will be. And you can see plenty more of that on the BBC Sport website. Now in the Scottish Premiership this evening, for 70 minutes, it was Livingston nil, Hearts nil. At the full-time whistle, it was Livingston 5 Hearts nil, an extraordinary last 20 minutes at the Almond Vale Stadium. Hearts were 1 0 down before they had Arno June sent off for a second yellow just moments later. Dolly Menger doubled Livy's lead with an impressive effort, shimming his way through a sea of Hearts defenders. Ryan Hardy then scored twice in three minutes before Sean Byrne completed a crazy match. Livingston climbed to fifth. Hearts missed the chance to join Celtic at the top of the table. Now, West Bromwich Albion are up to third in the championship after coming from behind to win 2-1 at promotion rival Sheffield United. The Blades had led 1-0 in the first half, but an equaliser from Gareth Barry. And then this strike from former Arsenal and England fullback Kieran Gibbs turned it around for West Brom, who move above Sheffield United in the table and are now within three points of the automatic promotion. Exeter Chiefs will live to fight another day in the European Champions Cup after coming out on top in their must-win match at Gloucester. It was the first victory for the Premiership runners-up in Europe this season. The Chiefs scored four tries to Gloucester's three. Elsewhere, Scarlets remain winless and pointless after losing at Ulster. Now, it's been a golden day for Great Britain at the Track Cycling World Cup in London with five gold medals in the able-bodied competition. Laura Kenny, Katie Archibald, Nia Evans and Eleanor Dickinson smashed the world champions. America in the team pursuit, remarkably and unusually catching them with more than a kilometre remaining. The race ended in confusion. The catch normally signals the end, but nobody actually told the riders straight away. We wanted to go out to do a good time um, and I feel like we were on for a good time. We set ourselves up and, you know, we only had six laps left. Um, so it was a bit frustrating, you know, that there wasn't a flag because, I mean, we were lucky not to crash, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, a little bit frustrated, but obviously glad that we won. Well, there are four paracycling golds. Kadena Cox and Neil Farchi took top honours. Jodie Cundy won individual and team sprint titles as well. Now, the verdict in Jess Varnish's employment case against British cycling and UK sports will not be revealed until mid-January at the earliest. After four days of hearing evidence, the judge has told the tribunal she will now retire to deliberate. Here's our sports correspondent, David Ornstein. Well, it's here at the Manchester Employment Tribunal that Jess Varnish's case against British cycling and UK sports concluded this afternoon. Varnish alleged that British cycling exerted extreme control over her during more than a decade in the national setup. The 28 year old said that despite being self employed, the governing body influenced her life to such an extent that she was effectively an employee and so should have benefited from worker rights. British cycling and UK sport vociferously rejected her claims and argued that athletes, much like students, receive tax-free grants and therefore are denied employment status. If Judge Ross rules in favour of Varnish, she'll be able to step up her attempt to sue British cycling for wrongful dismissal and sex discrimination. While there could also be major repercussions 
for the way Olympic and Paralympic athletes are funded by UK sport in the future. A judgment is expected by mid-January. Well, let's rattle through a few more stories for you this evening. The former England spinner Ashley Giles is England's new managing director of men's cricket. He'll be responsible for the strategy, coaching and management. Giles replaces Andrew Strauss, who stepped down in October. And England's Justin Rose's hopes of ending the year as world number one are looking good. He needs a top 12 finish at the Indonesian Masters. He's currently fifth on eight under par. Now the Liverpool and Egypt striker Mohamed Salah has won the BBC African Footballer of the Year award for a second year running after scoring 41 goals so far in 2018 for club and country. Salah saw off competition from four other players to win the awards. Our reporter Mimi Fawaz is at Anfield. So Mohamed Salah winning the double for the BBC African Footballer of the Year and the only other player to that was Nigeria football legend JJ Okocha back in 2004. More than 650,000 people voted to crown Mohamed Salah as the king of African football. He beat up Sadio Mane, Khalidou Koulibaly, Mehdi Benatia and Thomas Partey. Now, I went on earlier on to Melwood Training Ground and I presented him with the award. So I'm here with the winner. Congratulations, Mohamed. Thank you. Take it. It's all yours. Thank Last you. year when I presented you with the award, you said you'd like to win it again this year. Yep. You've done it. What does it feel like being the first player since JJ Okocha in 2004 to win this back to back? <laughs> uh, I think it's a great feeling. Great feeling, you know. I would like to win it also next year. So <laughs> I'm looking forward from now. But you know, it's a great feeling to win another award two years in a row, so happy to win it. When you look back at your 2018, what have been for you some of the individual moments where you feel you were at the top of your game? I think there's many moments in 2018, like I can say like the game against Tottenham was top, the game against Rome here was also unbelievable. So each moment I feel I can go helping the team to to get the points. To, to be top in the, in, the, in the league, you know, and uh, that's always always great feeling. Anything that you'll be looking forward to in the coming year, in the, for you overall? I think uh, just to when I want to win something with the club. So everyone is excited, everyone is is happy about that. So I also try to push myself every day, you know, to to help the team to win something. I'm sure we. This season, everyone has a, I don't want to say motivation, but it's everyone wants to win something. So I think we will carry on until we see. Congratulations, Mohamed, the winner for the 2018 BBC African Footballer of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. So very delighted, Mohamed Salah there. Liverpool are top of the table, and Salah is hoping to have a good year ahead, hopefully winning some, of course, titles. And as well for club and country, for Egypt, they have the Africa Cup of Nations coming. The last time that Egypt won it was back in 2010. So Mohamed Salah is hoping for an even better year ahead. And that is all from Sports Day this evening from me and the rest of the team. Have a great weekend. Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With us, Joe Twyman, the director of the polling organisation Delta Poll and political correspondent for the London Evening Standard, Kate Proctor. Welcome both. Uh, many of tomorrow's front pages are already in, thankfully. Brexit dominates most of them. You won't be surprised. The FT reports that Theresa May has threatened to crash her own Brexit deal unless EU leaders agree to discuss the changes necessary for MPs to support it. Meanwhile, The Times says May's deal is dead, with most of her cabinet concluding that it will not be passed by Parliament. The Telegraph describes the Prime Minister as having a public meltdown after she allegedly accused Jean-Claude Juncker of calling her nebulous. 
The same altercation makes the front page of the Express, which leads with the headline, Why the hell do we bother? Bus stop in Brussels shows EU's disdain for Britain's Brexit wishes. It's quite a long headline, isn't it? Well done, Express. You win the prize for the longest one. And the uh, Guardian also carries pictures of the apparent argument between Theresa May and Jean-Claude Juncker saying the Prime Minister returns home empty-handed with no hope of further renegotiation. In other news, NHS cuts are putting patients' lives at risk, says the I Weekend. They say plans to close maternity services will endanger hundreds of patients. The mirror leads on a woman who allegedly lied about having terminal brain cancer, netting a quarter of a million pounds in the process. So uh, let's start with The Guardian. Uh, angry and bruised. May returns empty-handed and on the, the front page of The Guardian we've got these pictures of this uh, altercation, this robust discussion as uh, Theresa May described it with Jean-Claude Juncker. Today was a good day to be a lip reader. <laughs> Um, we, we, we had a pretty fun day at the Evening Standard, I have to say, when this came through. We'd already been working for a few hours. We had our story kind of set in stone, and, uh, and then this um, footage came through from Brussels of this altercation between the Prime Minister and uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the European Commission President. Um, she seems to have marched over to him and uh, was saying, saying, did you call me nebulous? And he's going, no, no, I didn't. Um, but it took us a good hour until, uh, until we could get a lit reader to, uh, to tell us exactly what was being said. And um, I think it just shows how strained relations are that they were having this ridiculous argument on the floor of this meeting about, um, about the word nebulous and, and how you know, the Prime Minister is extremely offended by this uh, summary of her Brexit negotiations. There has been, I think, um, a statement that's been seen certainly by some BBC correspondents that suggests that um, EU negotiators think that any future suggestions Britain might have are a bit on the vague side but it didn't appear from what I was reading as the wires were coming through last night that he was being personal about Theresa May. Everyone's a bit tired and emotional. Uh, yeah that's certainly the case. It, it seems to be slightly unclear whether he was talking about the plans or whether he was talking about the Prime Minister specifically, and uh, but it makes for it makes for good pictures, and, and most of the uh, most of the papers on their front page have this have this view. From a public opinion point of view, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. It's Christmas, so inevitably we're thinking about love. Actually, this could be the love actually uh, the love actually moment, and this could be Hugh Grant standing up to Billy Bob Thornton. Uh, but I think it's uh, obviously far more serious, uh, serious than that. And all of the papers talk about whether this is uh, a failure for Theresa May, whether she'll be able to get anything out of it. And certainly the noise coming out of Brussels is that there really isn't much room for legal agreements to be changed, which is, of course, the DUP's red line. Yeah. Why did she go back at all to Brussels? I've been saying for as long as we've had the withdrawal agreement, that's it. Don't come back and ask for, for anything different. It was very clear. I think she went back because she had to, and I think she felt it was. In, I mean, she had to go. It was planned, and we did hear that even if she'd lost the leadership um, of the Conservative Party on Wednesday night, she was still going to go to Brussels on Thursday morning. She had this planned, and I guess to do it to try and save face, to try and show members of her own party that, you know, there's still a lot more that she can do. Um, you know, there's some, some idea that so much of this is about show and it's about um, the negotiations being kind of theatrical and taking it to the wire um, and that Theresa May is part of this game. And so many of the papers have, have said how completely humiliating it, humiliating it was for her to come back completely empty-handed. Um, but for some people, I think that altercation she had with Juncker um, and was actually almost a show of strength in my opinion. I think she actually looked quite strong. I think it might be a bit slightly lone voice in all of this, but some people will interpret that as, um, you know, this handbagging kind of moment, you know, that Thatcher comparison that actually this strong woman is actually showing the EU exactly who's boss. I mean, maybe this is two years late, but I think for some people um, she will have shown a bit of strength today. Let's go on to the uh, FT weekend how far she wants to push that, Joe, because the headline here is May threatens to crash Brexit deal after summit. Yes, the suggestion is that she's going to uh, go back to Parliament before Christmas and arrange for, a, uh, <laughs> arrange for the vote to then fail, uh, which seems like an interesting negotiating tactic, certainly. Um, it may the, be th th then the question is, 
then what? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. The, the, I can't really see how the threat of that would necessarily force the hand of uh, force the hand of. The, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's a bizarre um, bizarre situation and. Uh, and again, it goes back to this. Uh, it goes back to what Coke was quite rightly saying about the fact that a lot of this may indeed be for show. It's in nobody's interest to make this look easy. Whether it's Juncker, whether it's May, whether it's the Conservative Party, whether it's the EU, they all want to make it look as if everyone has battled until the very last moment. And so, if you combine working very hard, looking very difficult, getting even token concessions, and then time running out. That may, and I do stress may, be enough to convince some, and I do stress some, MPs to come over to the side. Yeah, because we are weeks away, 15 weeks away, are we, until the, we, we're due to, to leave? Yeah. And, and, and Parliament, we're told, doesn't want a no deal. No, Parliament doesn't want no deal, but the idea that she's going to go in and, and crash Brexit by holding a snap vote on the, with, on the withdrawal agreement is, is just absolutely mad. I mean, there's only four days left of, um, before the Christmas recess, um, so I'm not, I really don't know if she's, she would be able to have this vote in time. And even if she does have the vote, um, I don't know who she's, who she's going to... Who who's this for? I mean, the EU just don't care. The EU certainly aren't going to take um, take this vote seriously, I don't think. But at the same time, this is a tried and tested method from Prime Ministers down the years. Wilson tried it and was successful in 1975. Cameron tried it and was unsuccessful in 2016. And so maybe she hopes that it can be third time lucky and, uh, and that she can come back with something that she can then sell to the British people to her own party, to the Commons, as sufficient concessions. The, I, the key point is the DUP, and I don't think they'll go for it, but you never know. I guess she's trying to threaten the EU with no deal um, and banking on the fact that no deal is such a terrible option, the EU will come to their senses and realise this, you know, we're so close to a no deal scenario now, we are going to have to offer a bit more. That's the only reason I can think that she would um, crash Brexit as the, the FT. The uh, Daily Eric Telegraph Planning. says, I've been very clear, we've got that picture again, don't call me nebulous. Um, this war of words. It is an unusual way in which, and we've, going back to the same um, uh, photograph, we've referred to it several times, it is unusual to see her in this sort of state, though, isn't it? Uh, because she is so very measured, so yeah. very private. The Telegraph here describes it as a public meltdown. Um, I don't know that I'd call it that. I didn't, it see it, that I, didn't, I didn't see it that way. It was unusual. It was kind of out of character. She was clearly talking to him, to him really forcefully. Um, I don't think it was a, a meltdown. She's been urged to wield the handbag, as, as you talked about. I think, I think that's a bit of a lazy characterisation that, uh, that female, woke, female prime ministers <laughs> have, to, uh, have to emulate the only other female <laughs> prime minister we've had, because, you know, they're both women. Uh, yeah, there's no way you could be anything else, no, anything no. new and different. I do, what I do like this is that there was an online rush to define the ill-defined. Apparently Google was inundated with searches for the word nebulous <laughs> after it's been banded around a lot today. Well, are we um, absolutely sure it was nebulous and not nebula, uh, the character from The Avengers? Not at all. I, I, mean, it, I think after your... a whole day of looking at this, it's <laughs> nebulous. <laughs> but but uh, Jean-Claude Juncker did talk about you know, his Latin root as well. So that was, you know... I it, it's just really quite amusing that the thing we see her fire and her passion about being potentially called ne nebulous, it's, it's just such a bizarre state of affairs that that's the one word in all of this where we've really seen her come alive. And she's certainly been called um, a lot worse by some of her own backbench MPs in but I don't, weeks. But I don't think those backbench MPs will think this is anything other than a good look for her. Shall we um, move on and talk about something other than Brexit? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we want to do that? Well, we, we'll come back to it. You can rest assured in 40 minutes when we have another bite at these. Uh, the eye. NHS cuts put patients' lives at risk. Um, some services are so poor in some places that they're going to be closed, downgraded, 
and then people will find themselves obviously having to travel further for what should be better services and we have seen this done before. This article specifically uh, focuses on a hospital in Poole where the A&E services and the maternity services are, uh, are being downgraded and the implications that, that will have. And although it only focuses, seems to focus on, on one particular area, it's obviously an interesting representation of the problem that, uh, that the NHS faces across the country. And it's Christmas, it's winter, yeah. and every Christmas you, uh, you can't go wrong with a story about... Uh, about NHS problems and uh, and the difficulties of cold weather, it's it's a staple. We're only just at the start of that, aren't we? Yes. With, uh, yeah, the colder weather. It's, coming it's up. a staple along with Christmas TV. This other um, the article goes on to talk about other hospitals in other places: Shropshire, Somerset, Huddersfield, Kent, Perth. Uh, among those also facing closure, downgrading or, or merging, because there was a, a a move a few years back to create these very large centres of excellence yeah. which were quite unpopular with people even though medically it might be a safer thing of doing because people are very very um, yeah. attached aren't they to their local hospitals of course, of course. assuming of course that they're functioning I mean, I, decently. I worked as a local news reporter um, for various different papers in the north of England and um, NHS restructures and A&E closures or A&E downgrading is a really um, emotive issue for people and it does really matter and if you live in a rural area where your nearest hospital is maybe 40 minutes away um, and then to see it move maybe just another 10 minute journey away I mean it, it can be the matter of life or death for people that's why people find it so emotive and get so angry when they see that their A&E services are, are being restructured probably for about the tenth time yeah, and, and also we know that ambulance services are under pressure too, and if they've got to travel even further to collect people and drop people off, that, that just adds to that pressure too, doesn't it? It's a hugely emotive issue. There's no, uh, there's no doubt about that, and it's one that, uh, it's one that will run and run because, sadly, unfortunately, people will always fall ill, people will always, uh, will always die, and uh, and it's always a difficult, uh, it's always a difficult situation. But uh, it equally. A powerful political issue, and uh, and so it's the closest thing we have to uh, to a secular religion in this country. No one has got close to the solution for cracking it, uh, and funding is clearly an issue. And, the, and so as a result, the stories just rumble on. Yeah, and there, there are some hospitals which you just keep coming back to all the time, don't you? Shrewsbury in particular, mm -hmm. which we've talked about for months, if not years, yeah. and these persistent problems that they can't seem to overcome. Yeah, um, I think in, in some ways that I think it's probably pretty good that the IPAP has gone with a story like this. Everyone else is talking about Brexit, but we always have to remember, you know, Brexit is it's so complicated. It obviously affects everyone in the country, but day to day people want to know about their NHS and they want to know that things are in good hands. And this is just an, another pretty depressing story that, I mean, the funding isn't there, um, the structuring isn't correct, and ultimately that patients aren't getting the service that they deserve. So, um, yeah, in a whole sea of Brexit front pages today, um, I think uh, for, for tomorrow going into Saturday, I think this is a, probably a really good one from the IT. And of course, there's, a, there's an interesting point about the fact that while we're all discussing Brexit, while the government is using up all its Life bandwidth on. on Brexit, there are other issues out there. Yeah, there are. Um, we're going to talk about a photograph now. Here it is <laughs> on the Times. And it is uh, a photo of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge with their children, Louis, Charlotte and George. It's a photo that's being used for their Christmas card. It says they're having a blast. I wish I could, my children are older than this, but I wish I could get my children to smile for the camera. <laughs> they only ever grimace. Um, so the idea of trying to sort of formulate that to send out yeah, to everybody it's a, it's is a really, impossible. It's a really jolly little picture of the family. And um, we don't see very many pictures of, of Louis. I think this is the... Played here by a 50-year-old man. <laughs> you think he's just a little bit old? <laughs> he looks like a very small, very old man. <laughs> Babies do. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting... <laughs> I think I'm not suggesting you probably that's, did I'm sure, I'm sure I, well, my mum tells me I was a very beautiful baby. Of and why did. should she lie? <laughs> uh, I think uh, what we do know, though, is that this, to, uh, I believe, it's been reported that this is the first time that Prince George has been pictured in long trousers. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time yeah, he's been allowed out yeah. publicly not wearing shorts, <laughs> which I think is pretty close to, uh, uh, to some, uh, some nasty parenting. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's pretty good going, actually, isn't it? So I, I, 
to last that long without a long pair of yeah, trees. He's, he's a real boy now. <laughs> yes, yeah, he, he's been loud. I mean, but we have no evidence, indeed, that Prince William isn't wearing shorts. Well, that's, so, true. You know, that's true. Swings and roundabouts. That's it for the papers, but only for the moment. Uh, don't forget, you can see the front pages of the papers online on the BBC News website. It's there for you seven days a week at bbc.co.uk forward slash papers. If you miss the programme any evening, you can watch it later on iPlayer. Don't do that. Come back and join us again <laughs> at half past 11 and we'll, we'll bring you some more front pages with uh, Joe and Kate. Um, I think it's the weather. Next, I'll see you in a minute. Hello. After several days of quiet weather, Saturday couldn't be more different. It's hard to overstress how hazardous some of the weather will be for some of us on through Saturday into early Sunday. Met Office amber warnings in force for ice and snow. In terms of ice, that comes from freezing rain. Really unusual, almost unheard of, to have such a high level of warning for it as well. That's rain that freezes instantly on contact with frozen surfaces. And it's a greater risk here for parts of the Midlands, Northern England and Scotland through this zone on through Saturday into early Sunday and then north of the central belt in Scotland snow drifting in the strengthening winds piling up in the hills and mountains we've had cold air coming in around high pressure now Atlantic weather systems coming in with moisture into that cold air overnight we see outbreaks of rain pushing into Northern Ireland lots of Wales and southwest England ahead of that breeze but it's cold and frosty once again remember all of this cold air these freezing surfaces ready for that moisture to fall on top of them and freeze instantly causing ice rink conditions in places later on saturday now during saturday for northern ireland for wales and southwest england we'll see the rain turning heavier plenty of standing water maybe 30 to 50 millimeters 50 to 60 mile an hour winds developing to and across the uk